Welcome to Rex's Bible Minute, a weekly video where we talk about Jesus, Christianity, and anything along those lines. Uh, we are in week 35 of our study of Revelation, chapter 21. We're not going to quite finish chapter 21, but we're, we're getting close to the end of this here book. Um, we're going to be in verses uh, 6 through 21 today. So, quick recap, um, Revelation, all about encouragement. Uh, and evil has been dealt with at this point. That's the pattern. Evil is dealt with. God lets it destroy itself, and then he makes things right. And the whole point, the way it's encouraging, is the, there's a promise at the end, right? There's a reward for the suffering. Like this this book was written 2,000 years ago to Christians who were suffering at the hands of an empire that was hostile to their faith, that treated them poorly, caused them to lose their jobs, their lives, their families, Um all because they chose to follow Jesus. And so Revelation is, is meant to be encouraging, but also motivating. Like, do better. You know, conquer. Stay strong. Trust in Jesus. Uh, get through this. Hold tight. Even if it costs you your life, stay strong all the way to the end because it's worth it. And now we're getting to the point where we see that it's worth it. And so there's the theme throughout the Bible that everything is kind of going back to, to the Garden of Eden. In the sense that God had a design that he wanted. And his design boils down to three basic things. God wanted a people to live in the place he created for them to live in his presence. People, place, presence. And so Revelation 21 is a really, really important chapter because it's the only place, well, it's not the only place, but it's the primary place we get to see that finally happen. It's talked about some of the prophets as we've talked about throughout this study, but here we really get to see it finally come to fruition. So let's go ahead and read our section of the scripture today and uh, we'll break it down. So starting in verse 6, it says, Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I fr will freely give water to the thirsty, water from the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. But as for cowards, faithless people, the unclean, murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their destiny will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The one of, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Then he took me up and took me in the spirit up a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God. It is, it is radiant, like the radiance of a rare and precious jewel, like a jasper of stone, crystal clear. It has a great high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates, and names inscribed on the gates, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. There are three gates coming in from the east, three gates from the north, three gates from the south, and three gates from the west. And the wall of the city has a founda twelve foundation stones, and on them are written the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who was talking with me had a golden measuring rod so that he could measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city stands four square with the same length and breadth. He measured the city with his rod. It was twelve thousand stadia, that is, fifteen hundred miles, with the length, the breadth, and the height being equal. Then he measured its walls, and it was 144 cubits in terms of human measurement, which was what the angel was using. The material of which the wall is built is like jasper, and the city itself is pure gold like glass. The foundation of the city are city wall are decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation is jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates are the twelve pearls, with each gate consisting of a single pearl. The street of the city is pure gold, clear as glass. Now, Something to remember, and we talked about this last week. These are road signs. Remember that. That these are road signs. You drive along the highway, you see a sign that says, Hey, Louisville, 100 miles ahead. What's ahead? Louisville. Do you know what Louisville looks like based on that sign? Do you know what it smells like? Do you know how friendly the people are? Do you know how beautiful it is? Do you know how good the food is? Like, do you know how good their sports team? Like, you, you don't know anything based on the sign other than it's that direction. That's what this is. This is a road sign telling us this is what's coming. 
it doesn't tell us a whole lot. And so it's, it's not about figuring out all the details from what we read, but understanding that th- there's something ahead that's coming our way. And we see a, a lot more of that beautiful language that, that John uses. In order to understand it, we need to remember, uh, do a little history on the temple and the tabernacle. See, initially, God didn't dwell with his people. God, Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery. They were to be God's people, but they were rebellious people. And so God met with Moses on Mount Sinai, gave him the tablets. And while he was up there the first time, uh, they started taking gold and melding it into a, a golden calf. You know, as Aaron, Moses' his brother, did this and said, this is the gods that led you out of Egypt. And God was about done with, with Israel at that moment. It took Moses pleading with God, don't give up on this project yet. Uh, and so Moses went back up the mountain, and he brought back the, the plans for the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is a fancy word that just means dwelling place. It's a tent, right? So God gave Moses plans to build this special tent where he would dwell with his people. This was significant because that was the first time God dwelt with humanity since the fall in Eden. And so God tabernacled with the people of Israel in their travels until eventually the temple was built. And when the temple was built, God tabernacled in it. And in both cases, the, the, the temple and the tabernacle, when, it was, when God came to dwell in it, it was, it was demarcated. It was measured. We talked about this in chapter 11 because that was saying this is God's space. This is God's place. This is, this is his. It is clearly marked out. That's a big deal. And so we see that in the, 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 the temple dwelling ceremonies that you read about in Kings and you read about in Exodus, you see that there's, this, is, this matches really close to what we see in Revelation 21. That the new Jerusalem, the city, is the new temple. That this is where God dwells. He dwells with humanity. New Jerusalem comes down from God, it says, and it lands on the new earth. Remember that, that this is the pure. There is no corruption. There is no evil. There is no deviation from God's plan here, from his design. And so we see that God dwells with his people. And Jerusalem is his temple. It is his throne. And all the dimensions, all the things that we see back that up. We see that the, the, the city is a cube, well, the Holy of Holies was a box. That's what the word, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the word Ark just means box, right? The, the, the Ark, Noah's Ark, was a giant box, right? So, so the, it's a cube. It's representative of a box. It's decorated, full of precious stones. It's, uh, things are made of gold. They're clear. They're pure. This is representing God's glory. God's glory is filling this whole place. Uh, that's why the, the Ark of the Covenant was decorated so well. It's why the temple was decorated so well. It's why the tabernacle was decorated so well. It is supposed to be representative of God's glory. And we see that there's an intermingling between humanity and God, unlike we saw with the temple and the tabernacle. We see that the foundation stones are each representing one of the 12 apostles of Jesus. We see the 12 tribes represented. We see that there's, there's decorations everywhere showing that, that this is God meeting with humanity. It's no longer God's space, and God's people aren't allowed in it except on special sacred time. Like, no, they build up the foundation of God's temple now. And that's a big change. It shows that what God's intention is for us. And we see that things are different on this side of things. City gates were built and walls were built in ancient times to protect people, right? The gates were built so that you could close them quickly and keep invaders, keep bad people out. The gates are never closed in New Jerusalem because there is none of that. There is no deviation. There is no us versus them anywhere in the new creation. All are welcome. The gates are always opened. And so when we see God speak at the beginning of this section, we see, he says, this is the reward. He says, there's no place for cowards. And you might be like, hold on, I thought like Christianity was the meek and mild religion, right? The the ones that most, a lot of preachers preach. It's a meek and mild religion where we're going to be nice to everybody. You know how much strength and bravery it takes to be a true Christian? (laughs) To look the rest of the world the rest of our culture in the eyes and say, yeah, there's, there's a better way. To say, I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to be different. I'm going to follow what Jesus taught. That takes bravery. 
I mean, we're blessed in that we don't have, it's not going to cost us our lives the way it did for those Christians that, that John was writing to when he penned these words. But the reality is it, it, there's no place for cowards in Christianity. If Christianity is comfortable, you might need to rethink how your faith works in your life because it's not. It's not easy. It's not easy to be honest and true and real. It is difficult. It takes work. It takes effort. Christianity is not just something you, you, you do. It's not just part of your life. It is your life. And if it's not, you might need to step back and reevaluate things because God says there's no place for cowards in the next world, in this, this created world, in, in the new creation. He says there's no place for liars, thieves, murderers, sorcerers. There's no place for any of that. Only those who conquer. And if you remember from our earlier studies, you know that conquering means staying strong and staying faithful. It means being active. It means taking ownership of the Great Commission and, and going out into the world to, to make disciples, to be a disciple that makes disciples. That is what Jesus tells us we need to be doing. Because here's the, the big principle here that so many people miss out on. It's this idea called the future present or the present future. That what we do now doesn't simply matter just now, but it has ramifications into that eternity future that we see here. And we also see that in that eternity future, what happens then matters to us now. It impacts us now. That as Christians, we have the right to walk those streets already, not on some future moment, that as part of God's kingdom, as, as believers, as disciples, we are part of that. That is, that is home and so what we do now has to matter into the future. We have to have that mindset. We have to be thinking about who else can I get there? Who else can I bring with me? Who else can I show that this is, this is the only way? It's not just a way. It is the only way. Hopefully this was encouraging to you and, and caused you to think and maybe answered a few questions. If you have any more questions that I didn't answer, by all means reach out. Otherwise, see you next week.